The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, my name is James and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. Normally, I review stuff for your electronics workbench. This video, however, is more of a how-to guide on multimeters. A multimeter is an essential tool for an electronics workbench. So essential that I have seven of them in my lab. Seriously. Back in the first episode of Workbench Wednesdays, I reviewed this pin style meter and compared it to a larger traditional meter. While I did cover some measurement basics in that video, I didn't explain a whole lot about them. So in this episode, I'm going to show you how to make some common and not so common measurements with a digital multimeter. While there are many form factors for a meter, there are two major types, manual and automatic ranging. Back before I was the bald engineer, I had this manual ranging meter. To use it, you start at the highest range and work your way down until the meter overloads. It is the same method that an auto ranging meter does, but you know, automatic. Keep in mind with an automatic meter, you can always manually set the range. On the question of which should you choose, that's a budget decision for you. Personally, I like the simplicity of an auto ranging meter. Speaking of budget, an often overlooked aspect of a multimeter purchase are the leads. High quality leads have sharp tips, pliable plastic, and thick but flexible cables. In general, the more expensive the meter, the higher quality the leads. Most DMMs offer basic measurements like voltage, resistance, continuity, diode junctions, and current. As their price goes up, they may add measurements like capacitance, temperature, frequency, and maybe even a transistor tester. But here's the thing, DMMs can only measure voltage. So then where do these other measurements come from? At the core is an analog to digital converter, which is measuring a precision voltage divider. Changing the multimeter's range changes this divider, but the total impedance is usually around 10 mega ohms. The other DMM measurements sit in front of this core voltage meter. Resistance and continuity use a constant current source and Ohm's law to determine a resistance. There is a reason multimeters have a separate input terminal for current measurements. It's actually voltage being measured across a shunt resistor. That resistor is very small, like milliohms small. If you applied a large voltage to this shunt, it would be destroyed, which is why DMMs incorporate fuses on the current terminals. Here's a pro tip like legit pro tip. Whenever you finish making a current measurement, immediately move the lead from the A terminal to the V terminal. Even if you intend to make another current measurement right away, move the lead. Measuring voltage while connected to the A terminal will absolutely blow that protection fuse. Some meters will include features like min and max, which will hold the minimum and maximum values being measured. A relative function is useful when comparing measurements between boards or components. For example, you can set the first resistor as a baseline and then see how the others compare. Now that we've taken a look at this versatile tool, let's take a look at some of the measurements that are possible using it. The most common measurement for a multimeter is voltage. Voltage is a parallel measurement and is sometimes the only in-circuit measurement that can be made. The common lead becomes the reference. So you can measure a voltage relative to ground or you can measure two voltages relative to each other. By default, most meters measure DC, but they can also measure AC. Now, this does not just mean the AC you might find in your wall, although it can. It can also measure AC components of a DC signal. And to demonstrate that, we're going to change over to a current measurement. Unlike voltage, current has to be measured in series, which means breaking the circuit. If you try to measure current in parallel, like voltage, you'll blow up that little tiny resistor, or hopefully the fuse protecting it. For my device under test, I have to disconnect the USB supply and instead power the board directly. The connection path goes from the supply's positive output to the meter's positive input. Then from the meter's common to our loads plus five volt pin. Finally, the Pi's ground pin connects back to the power supply's negative terminal. This arrangement is called high side sensing. It keeps the duct connected directly to ground. Low side sensing, however, puts the meter between the load and ground. While this might work, 
keep in mind that the sense resistor in the multimeter will drop a small voltage. So the device under test is no longer connected to ground and does not see a perfect zero volt reference. My preference is high side, but I'll leave the debate of which is best to the comments section. Now, when I measure current, I usually draw a quick diagram like this one. It helps to make sure that I connect the circuit correctly. And for real, this is the diagram I drew to complete these shots. The power supply's current meter shows about the same current as the DMM. And you might conclude that this is the current draw for the Raspberry Pi. But this is only the DC or average current. Switching the meter to AC tells a slightly different story. The current is far more active and a little bit more interesting than just looking at DC. Normally, AC on a DMM is meant to measure a sine wave, like from mains AC. A coupling capacitor removes the DC offset and then averages the remaining waveform to calculate the effective DC, or root mean square, value. True RMS meters do not require a sine wave. They can calculate an RMS value of a complex waveform like the ripple current of our Pi. Even with a true RMS meter like this one, the AC RMS measurement is still off by a little bit. So I really only use it to check the AC component to find out if there's any spikes or peaks in my voltage or current measurement. Even though there are two modes for it, resistance and continuity is one measurement. Measuring an individual resistor is straightforward connect the leads and get a value. When working with a circuit board, this simple measurement does start to get complicated. Remember, the DMM is applying its own source to make this measurement, so the device under test needs to be unpowered. That means no power. Nope, not on. Zilch, zero, nada. Be careful when measuring resistors in circuit. Current may leak to other parts of the circuit, giving an inaccurate reading. For example, resistors in parallel will measure the entire parallel branch. Continuity is useful to see if a trace has point-to-point -point contact. Some meters will also display the resistance, so you can tell if a path is a short or if there's something in between. Measurements with ICs can be unpredictable, like with these RAM chips. My best tip for measuring in-circuit resistance is that you need to consider the rest of the circuit. That's where schematics can really help when making that measurement. Diodes turn on when their forward voltage is applied. So in diode mode, a DMM displays the voltage which is dropping across the diode junction. The positive DMM lead identifies the anode and the common DMM lead identifies the cathode. When the leads are swapped and the diode is reversed, you'll see 2.8 or 2.9. As far as my meter is concerned, it means the circuit or diode is open. The 2.89 volts on my meter is the maximum forward voltage that it can measure. Most meters will just say OL or overload when they detect an open or diode. And as you'll see in the next couple of measurements, that point will actually matter. Another diode we can measure is an LED. Here's a two color LED with common cathode. The meter provides just enough current to turn it on so we can see which pin is the cathode and then which anode pins are which color. The other piece of information we get is that the forward voltage of a green LED is around 1.8 volts and red LEDs is around 1.6 volts. But I already covered that point in the episode with the pin style DMM. In that video, I also mentioned you should not rely on the length of the leads to identify anode and cathode. It's a convention, not a standard. And after all, we've got multimeters to figure that out. Using the diode test function, we can determine a MOSFET's pinout. But why would you need to do that? Well, here's an example. The datasheet lacks basic pinout information, so let's see if we can find it on our own. Remember that a MOSFET has a gate, drain, and source. When enough voltage is applied to the gate, a channel is created between the drain and source. First, we need to measure all of the pin pairs. 1 and 2, 1 and 3, and then finally 2 and 3. Pins 2 and 3 appear to be a short, which means pin 1 has to be the gate. Looking closer at the MOSFET symbol, notice there is a body diode between the drain and source. Since we saw a short between the drain and source, we know that the transistor is turned on. Wait, but how? It's just sitting in the breadboard. Backing up, remember we connected the DMM to the gate and source. We just didn't know which pin was the source yet. It may not be obvious from the schematic symbol, but the gate is a very tiny capacitor. 
The DMM charged up the MOSFETs gate just enough to turn on the MOSFET, just enough for the DMM to get confused. So we need to discharge the MOSFET to determine which pins are the drain and source. Simply touching and shorting pins 1 and 2 discharges the gate. The MOSFET is now in an off state. With the positive lead on pin 2 and the common lead on pin 3, the DMM shows an open. Swapping the leads shows a forward voltage of 0.5 volts. These measurements mean pin 3 is the anode and pin 2 is the cathode of the body diode. That means that pin 2 is the drain and pin 3 is the source. Personally, I think it's pretty cool that you can use the DMM to help identify a transistor's pinout. As it turns out, if I had gone to the last page of the datasheet, it was actually shown there in teeny tiny print. By the way, the LED and MOSFET I just showed are coming back in a future episode, so make sure you are following or subscribe to Element 14 Presents to see when and why. These are the kinds of measurements I make with a multimeter, and I know this isn't all that you can measure, so I want to hear from you. Use the link in the description to head over to Element 14 and let me know either what you use your DMM to measure or what would you like to know how to measure? Until next time, thank you for watching. If you'll excuse me, it's time for me to get back to measuring stuff on my electronics workbench.